Uh, okay, everybody, we're going to start so we can finish on time. Uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you uh, very much for coming here tonight. Uh, thank you very much to uh, Michael for uh, letting me here for the invitation. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to be talking about uh, some of the methodologies that I've been uh, developing and and implementing as well, uh, uh, putting together for the last uh, 18 years working with the athletes. Uh, uh, I've been uh, all my life involved in, uh, in high performance and sports. I, uh, as a kid in the, uh, as in the academy teams, I played six years for Real Madrid, the uh, soccer team, and then I, I discovered cycling and I changed cycling and uh, I, I, I raced bikes for a number of years, for about 12 years, and I was a professional for two years, never like a top one, in either in soccer or in so, exactly, but at least I tried, you know. But, uh, but anyway, what I mean is, like, I've been all my life trying to uh, to, to get the kind of edge, right? And, I, and I've been always exposed to high performance, uh, and that's one of the things that I've been doing since then, and I still do. Now, uh, I'm a professor of school of medicine at the University of Colorado here, and one of the things that I'm doing now, on top of keep working with all these and also the teams, is uh, I'm working with uh, trying to bring these methodologies that we have been developing with the data assets over the years. And try to develop those to um, uh, with uh, populations with chronic diseases like uh, type 2 diabetes, uh, metabolic syndrome, cardiovascular disease. You know, there are a lot of other things that we can do here that, that we are already applying. You know, we have to do more research as well. So I've been working with all kinds of athletes uh, uh, in teams, uh, professional Olympics as well, worldwide for these past years. And uh, so, yeah, you know, it's been an interesting journey, and I've been able to learn a lot, uh, and I still learn every day. Like, a great presentation by, by Tommy, right? So one of the things that I, uh, I, I I always follow, you know, this guy over here, Peter Drucker, right? And what is that? So Peter Drucker is, is considered like the man who invented management, right? And uh, the father of business analytics and uh, the father of a modern business corporation. So for those of you who haven't heard of him, he is the guy who will go to all the top companies in the world and will teach them how to improve their performance. So, uh, you know, he will teach them, you know, how to improve uh, the way that the workers work, uh, the way to optimize the lights and make the uh, that's a chunk on the assembly chain, what's the difference between the operator being on the right versus to the left side, you know, and then how to uh, ship and pack this better, you know, and save millions of dollars and improve performance, right? And uh, he's very well known in that few years ago. But one of his uh, uh, phrases that I always apply, and that's what I'm trying to do with Apple, one of the things I always apply is this one. What gets measured gets managed, right? And that's something that I've been always uh, trying to do with the this year. Now, what I see is that when it comes to sports, many times things are never uh, measured, you know? So we go by the field, you know? And many times what we do is like, the wind is from here or the wind is from there. I'll go that way, you know? And we, we, we don't manage things very well, you know? So when it comes to performance, there are, there are many uh, uh, factors for performance. So the first one is your physiology, your genes, how, how you're born, right? Uh, uh, this is not a fixed thing as we, 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 we have thought, you know? Uh, because the genes, you know, are very altered, you know? And that's what we know very, very well. You know, you need to improve your genes, but they're very altered by training. And that's why you can really improve your, your genetics. Uh, here, you know, then the nutrition is a key aspect as well because the, the nutrition is going to help you to assimilate training, improve the genes, recovery. Uh, then we need to know the health and injuries, of course, is critical. Uh, we need to have a good monitoring. I'm going to talk about these. You know, how you're assimilating training, how you're assimilating competition, you're getting fatigued and recovery. Um, you know, the psychology is a very important piece as well. You know, I, I tend to recommend athletes to go to a, a, a sports psychologist, you know, uh, not, not because they're crazy, right, although most of them are a little cuckoo, right, but, you know, one of the things that I try to send them there, you know, because I, uh, I, I've seen many times there's the, there's the, 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 the psychological component in speed, and, uh, and there's the, the, the fear to, uh, to lose, right, but the fear to win. I've seen many times athletes, you know, getting to the top of their career and falling apart. You know, and start crying. You know, for example, at a cycling big tour, you know, like a, being in the hotel in the, with the yellow jersey or whatever, boom, starts crying like a baby. You know, that's the fear to win. You know, and that's why I tend to hate, you know, the psychological aspect is important. And the last one here, we have a lifestyle. The lifestyle here is in, in red color. And I think the red because we should be able to monitor all these parameters, right? The red is kind of like 
it's up to you. You know, up to the actor. We can't call someone at two in the morning and say, hey, are you in your party about, you know, about town or, or are you in bed sleeping, right? So that's something. But we tend to, we have to assume that professional or indeed athletes, you know, they're formal people, right? Uh, anyways, but we should be able to monitor this. And that's what I ask, you know, this how many parameters are we controlling? You know, are we controlling the genetics? Any kind of really know. You know, how, how do you know your genes? You have to do some metabolics or physiological testing. It's not done. How about the training? How can you really make sure, how can you really know that your training is the right one if you don't know where you start with? How do you know your nutrition? You know, there's not much, you know, dietary analysis is unbelievable, you know, at the pro level, you know, and of course, throw that, you know, the whole lot. All the books out there and the internet and the blog about this diet or the other one, you know, and uh, it's, it's a bad situation. The monitoring, you know, how do you know if an athlete is a similar training competition? That's something that we don't, we don't know either many times because there's no monitoring on that, you know, and uh, the psychology is there, but the health and injuries are really, really monitored because, yeah, it's something tangible, right? You can't run, so of course, you see medical attention, right? And uh, physical therapy. So, so I think that many of these parameters are never uh, uh, measured, you know, and that's one of the things that, as Michael was saying, is we're in the baby steps or trying to measure things as well. And this is going to be like a big uh, field in the future. So, especially in team sports, every team measures every single ticket they sell, every single popcorn, every single beer, right? They don't measure the players, you know? They're starting doing more things with analytics, right? And this is a great thing, you know, and, and, uh, and, the, and the Nuggets are lucky to have someone like Tony, right, to, to, to understand all this. But when it comes to the physiological parameters, they're not doing anything, for example. You know? But that's something that, you know, and we go to the highest level of the sport. So this is, this is one of the things that, especially here in the US, we're in the baby steps. You know, that's one of the things that I'm trying to figure out. I came here five years ago, and, uh, and uh, you know, I have a concept of the US wise. It's, Number one power in sports, you know, very scientific, you know. And when I came here, like, wow, it's, it's the complete opposite. You know, it's it's a desert out there. And I'm trying to figure out why. Because I would go for individual sports, team sports, and hey, you guys do this, like, no, we never even heard her about it. Where is she? Well, you do this, no. So like, man, how can it be possible? You know? However, when we when we see the Olympics, for example, not at international level, they you know, they're number one, right? But we're 320 million people, so it's it's easy, okay? Because you always want to have like a world class athletes popping out of everywhere out of 320 million people. So this is, for example, um, what did I say? Oh, not here. Not reaching out. Sorry. Oh, my computer got it. So this is one of the things that, for example, we see in uh, in Sochi, right? Uh, the last Olympics. So we see that. The U.S. about 350 million people. Uh, the European Union, right? If we gather all the European countries, you know, the European Union, who supports the United States of Europe, but they're never going to compete under the flag. But if they were to, be about the same population. And Russia is about 145 million people, right? So let's count the medals now. The gold medals, the U.S. was nine medals or ten. I did not get to the last one. Obviously, but European Union did 30 medals. You know, way bigger, way more than that. That's gold medals. The total number of medals from 48 to 115, right? It's a, it's overwhelming. You know, when we go to London, yeah, the European Union countries comprising uh, the, the European Union, the countries comprising the European Union, London was 325, 315 here, China 1.3 billion, Russia 1.5, the U.S. number one in the in the ranks. Now let's go to gold medals: 46 versus 70, right? Uh, 104 versus 208. Right? So that's one of the things that, you know, that, you know, and the U.S. is analyzing this for sure. Now, why is this happening? This is happening because, you know, we don't need here in the U.S. to really optimize so much of the performance. Whereas, for example, in European countries, it's very, it's very, very big. Small country, maybe 10, 15, 20 million, you need to really produce Olympians, right? And you need to compete at the highest level. So you need to do whatever it takes. You know, you have to analyze one of the parameters. Physiological testing, nutrition, training, be very, very, very meticulous about what you do. I've worked, for example, with, uh, with many, many athletes, but for example, it comes to my mind that Roy, Roars, right? I've worked with Olympian Roars. To produce an Olympic Roar from where I am, from, from Spain, you know, it's very difficult. You have to do a lot of nutrition, testing, more analysis, training. It's very, very difficult just to send someone to the, to the final, right? However, here, you know, what it takes is like one weekend 
uh, which is about a month and a half uh, away from the World Championships, they put together a different rowing clubs at the six minute, uh, 2,000 meter, which is a little business on the indoors rebounder. Anybody can show up, <laughs> the fastest guys, you know. You know? Very easy, you know. So that, that's one of the things, you wouldn't have to, to uh, optimize the patient so much, you know. And that's something that I, well, that's what I'm going to present, how we optimize the patient. Now, we see even in basketball, for example, in basketball, you know, uh, here is a big sport, right? But uh, in Europe, it's not, it's not so big sport. You know, any any neighborhood in, in LA has more 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 basketball players than than a country like Spain, for example, right? Uh, but I mean, not not I'm exaggerating a little bit, right? Because there are not nearly as many uh, basketball players over there. But we see the Olympics, for example, in the World Championships. In the final, it was the U.S. versus uh, Spain. You know, and in the Olympics, you know, two minutes before the end. You know, the U.S. only moved like four or five points ahead. You know, and if it wasn't for the three pointers, you know, there's no way that you would to beat Spain. They they were way physically more better. You know, were better athletes. They have used all these methodologies that I'm going to describe now. And whereas 10, 15 years ago, U.S. playing to Spain was like playing high school, right? A lot of countries are catching up. You know, and now that is something that the U.S. Olympic Committee, you know, has realized about this. They have a high performance department, and they have like five. Directors and each director is uh, is a, uh, in charge of different buckets of sports, right? How to put performance, you know? Because they really need to. It's a big country. We need to be on the same page, you know. So I've started working with them as well, and we're trying to put all these methodologies as well. But anyway, so one of the things that I try to do is uh, apply the scientific approach, right? Which is based in science. You know, science is a Latin word in scientia, and scientia means knowledge. We don't know that knowledge is power, so we need to know first and measure, right? So time is very limited for everybody, both elite athletes and recreational athletes. So optimization of time is potential and it's crucial. And the more athletes get to know how the body works, the better. Um, so without a knowledge and scientific approach, uh, it's, it's very difficult to optimize performance. So that's why again we have to measure things, you know. So uh, um, you know, and everything starts like when we measure things, we can get to know what is your ideal training program. You know, so for example, we cannot give the same training plan to Gabriel Salas, who is one of the best runners in history, or to uh, the same training program to um, uh, former Simpson. You know, so we're going to pay a former Simpson if we give this, this guy program. You know, uh, but maybe this is if, what I mean is like if we put together a standard program, we might pay former, and that might be enough dose for improvement for Gabriel Salas. You know, so that's why we have to measure first and get to tailor an individual training program. For each one. Now we have all these formulas that everybody has a uh, uh, C, you know, the 220 minus your age, the fat burning zone here that we see every day in the, the, the genes, right? Now everything's wrong here. <laughs> everything. You know, and it's very, very general. That's the 220 minus your age formula, there's no scientific evidence of it. It's, uh, it, it was developed by a guy called Cobornia 55 years ago. And it's not based on science, it's just mere observational things, you know. Uh, you say, oh, if your age is this, then eh, looks like that your maximum power rate is here. If your age is this, then eh, looks like that, that. But there's no research. And unfortunately, this is not now as a dogma. You know, and uh, it's used in fitness center, professional sport, the military, physicals, you know, and uh, it's something that, well, you know, that's where we're in the 21st century, you know. We, we have a lot of weapons to our disposal, so we really need to use it instead of this. And that's what I, you know, we're doing with the athletes. You know? It's about measuring every single component, right? So the first thing that I call coaching 101 when we start is that physiological testing, right? So it's crucial to start with first, what's that physiological metabolic parameters we have to each athlete in order to prescribe that that individual training plan, right? Um, we can see the engine of an athlete. Are we working with a Mini Cooper or with a Ferrari? No, we don't know. No, we have to find out. Um, and then we have to, uh, you know, see the weak and strong points of an athlete and, and, and identify where we can do better. You know, the evaluation in quantity, the quality of training. So this is very important. This is the picture that I show here. You know, this is the, uh, um, uh, this is the, you know, how old is this picture? <laughs> 101 years old. Uh, this is uh, out of a. Uh, um, August Cross Laboratory in Denmark. He, he was a Nobel Prize, and he built everything with his own hands. He, he studied physiology very well, and he got the Nobel Prize for that. But uh, he developed all the, you know, the mask and all the testing that he did. He developed that 101 years ago. The first uh, uh, spin bike, spin bike or stationary bike, he developed as well with his own hands. You know, uh, this is the the Harvard um, 
uh, fatigue laboratory that in the 20s attracted the best specialists in the world, you know, and we created lots of brainstorm and uh, and a lot of great research came out of there and was exported to the rest of the world, right? Now, here we are, 101 years ago, and still many professional athletes, they don't even know how the body works, you know? So that's why Michael was in the, in the infancy of this stage. And we really, really came through a lot here, you know? But uh, uh, anyway, so, so we, we, we measure different parameters, like lactate metabolism, fat metabolism, carbohydrate metabolism. We also measure the oxygen consumption, the these 2 max, a bunch of different parameters that give us out of overall metabolic efficiency. And uh, only with the evaluation of these parameters, we can really establish an appropriate individual training plan. Otherwise, we're really guessing. You know, and sometimes you see coaches that are very good, they have a, a very good sense of what they're doing, a very good, very intuitive, and they might not need so much information, you know, but they can definitely benefit from this. Many other times you see a coach who has no idea what's going on, you know. Maybe the entire team is going down and they're not they start very high in the season and they're going down for the playoffs. Nobody knows what's going on. And they blame the coach. And maybe they, the athletes, they're their first group. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're really fatigued and really tired. Nobody has measured that, you know, so they pass the blame on to the coach. So that's something that we can see. Or sometimes those analytics that Tommy was talking about, you know, all of a sudden the analytics go down. You know, what's going on here? The numbers are horrible. You know, why? We can identify all the parameters here, they're wrong, you know. So we, when it comes to uh, the, the physiological responses to exercise, we talk about central adaptations, which is like how the lungs, the heart, the veins, the arteries work. The main purpose is to deliver oxygen to the tissues. And the main representative of this is the, the VO2 max. Has anybody heard about that? It's a maximal oxygen uptake. That's the maximum amount of oxygen that someone can uptake, right? So this has been the gold standard for from the beginning of time, you know? Uh, and this is where, oh, my view too much is this, oh, you're here, you're there. But this is their ar archive term. Like, to be honest, in 18 years, I haven't used it. So this is very archive. You know? uh, this is what I call uh, to be a, a good athlete. You know? It's like a pizza, right? To have a pizza, you know, it's mandatory. You must have a, the tomato sauce. Without that, it's not a pizza, right? But that doesn't differentiate from the rest of the pizzas. The toppings, right? I don't want to differentiate. No. So the same thing, the view too much is the tomato sauce of the pizza. You just have to have it. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it's the top into which are here what happens at the local adaptations or the events happening at the cellular level. You know? So it's not about how much oxygen you can uptake, it's about how much oxygen the cell can utilize and how well the cell utilizes um, a different you know, the fats, the carbohydrates to produce energy, and how well the, the, cell, the cell deals with byproducts of metabolism. For example, like lactic acid or lactic. So this is this is what we have evolved a lot because we can now measure indirectly the cell. So we can tell us a health cell speaks up, speak up, you know. And this is where we see where we can really make a difference, and we can really uh, see that you know these are the parameters that, that they're the most important for athletes, right? So when we talk about, when we do this this testing, we do testing in the laboratory. Uh, the advantages of doing tests in the laboratory is that. Uh, we can control all the uh, environmental conditions and we can replicate these tests, right? And today, in two months, in 33 years, we can still do the same tests, right? And we can we get great data, you know, we work also with, our, with the Avalanche, with the Rapids, you know, local teams here. Uh, we, can, we, can, we can get pretty good data. Um, uh, we can also uh, uh, do uh, you know, the wind tunnel or other, other different places where we can do kinds of testing. You know, uh, this is something that I did in, in the wind tunnels in London. This is where my, my, my uh, Mercedes Formula One cars go, you know, to improve their aerodynamics. And now we're taking this to, to the cyclists as well, you know, for the time trials of discipline in cycling work is the, the fight against the clock, right? So the aerodynamics are very, very important. So we, we run into this and there's, there's like a 30 mile per hour wind here. This guy's a trainer, it's a 30 mile per hour wind. And uh, you know you get all this data about what's the position higher, lower, and according to that you can really see well with this position you're going to be you know uh, two seconds per kilometer faster you know so you can project what's the time right. Unfortunately, you know, I mean unfortunately, unfortunately who knows? But people are going to these tunnels everywhere like crazy. You know the, the hourly rate here is somewhere between fifteen hundred to three thousand dollars per hour, right? And you stand you stand there like four hours per cyclist. You know it's very expensive. So. When, when, when this happens, you know, like, 
in going back to the analytics and, and the Tony Tony data point, it's not just about getting so much data, you have to make sense out of it. You know, and there's so much more sometimes. So this is what was happening with Cypher. They were getting because they were talking, you know, engineers, they were throwing data. Uh, and I was seeing that cycles in the middle of the season, they would get rid of that position because it would make them slower. You know, so we're paying a lot of money to be slower. You know, it doesn't make any sense. And that's where I started to look at the metabolic response to a given position. So that's why I, I came out, you know, and I went to the wind tunnel, look at heart rate, look at lactic acid. And that's where I was like, look at the metabolic position. And then sometimes the, the most aerodynamic position is very task in metabolic speaking. So you don't want that position at all, you know, and you might just find that. And that's why the whole analytics and the metabolics, you know, they come together. One of the many sounds, right? So anyways, we can do a lot of things, you know, even in the swimming pool, we can just, you know, this is, this is we can increase the speed, right, of the water, of the current, uh, in the same manner that we do on the treadmill, and we can look at lactate, heart rate, and we can, therefore, tailor in the individual training program, you know, with the rollers, et cetera, you know. So I've been always very obsessed, you know, with measuring, you know, the metabolic data ever since I was in college, you know, I was always there, you know, I was a guinea pig for studies and things like that, so, you know, I've been, I've been doing a lot of things. So when it comes to the cellular level, you know, that's where we really want to look at. You know, so from this, we look at the, uh, um, the events happening at the cellular level can make a difference. And uh, maybe a graph, for example, can have a high degree two mass, but, you know, it's not the best one at all. You know, it's, it's what happens here at the cellular level. So of this, lactic acid, everybody has heard about lactic acid, right? Or lactate is the most important parameter. So this is where we can see that uh, this is a whole parameters I've been seeing over the years, uh, and I measure and I've been trying to innovate and get different parameters. Lactate is always the one that makes a difference, you know. So uh, the lactate comes. I'm going to show you a brief uh, back how it works. So we use fat or glucose for energy purposes. So when we use glucose, the byproduct of glucose utilization is lactic acid, right? So imagine a car between both and diesel gasoline and regular gasoline. Right? The diesel is very clean gasoline. Uh, the regular gasoline has a combustion that produces CO2, for example. So the glucose produces lactic acid, right? And that's what happens. So when we produce the lactic acid, this very quickly, when we go to lactic acid, the lactic acid tends to accumulate. Every time we produce glucose, the lactic acid it accumulates. And eventually, not lactic acid per se, but the hydrogen ions associated with lactic acid decrease the pH, decrease acidosis, and decrease the mass of contraction. You know, uh, so that's one of the things that one of the responsible for the fatigue. You know, it's like the muscles they they burn, right? And eventually, we cannot keep uh, uh, having a high intensity of contraction. You know, so it's very crucial in sports to clear lactic acid out fast. You know, that's key for sports. You know, that's something that we see across all the sports. Okay? So this is, for example, in cycling. This is a junior cyclists, this is amateur cyclists, these guys are pro tour, pro tour in cyclists that put into NBA or NFL, right? And this is the world class, you know, so these guys are the guys who win the Tour de France or, or the Tour of Spain or Poland, you know, the top guys in the world, right? So this is what we can see is that the difference are huge, you know, lactic now, at, at race we have about one millimole of lactic acid in this room right now, right? Uh, so this is what we see, like we do the protocol, we increase exercise intensity, and then uh, we get and measure the lactic acid. So as exercise intensity increases here, measure here in watts per kilogram, the lactic acid increases, and eventually shut you down. So for example, we see that at, at four watts per kilogram, the juniors are starting to hurt a little bit, noticing some effort, these guys less, these guys less, these guys are still at resting levels. 4.5, these guys are really hurting, these guys are, uh, you know, uh, you know, threshold. So these guys are below threshold. These guys are slightly about resting levels. You know, <laughs> big difference here. These guys are fried here. This is about getting fried. These guys are about threshold. These guys are below threshold. Right. So big differences. So for example, that's what we can predict performance very well. You know, from the data that we have in the laboratory. So this is the Tour de France, for example. One, you know, the other way is one of the most important stages. And this is for, for example, we see the typical tempo pace is about five watts per kilogram. And that's where we compare the junior cyclist, a junior, it's fried already at that tempo. It only lasts maybe like uh, 30 seconds, you know, boom, and it blows up. Amateur cyclists, you know, uh, yeah. like these are the competitive, like category ones, two, or so, they're really hurting here. They can only last maybe not even a kilometer. The, the average pro tour cyclist, they can last the entire climb, they hurt a little bit. And the world class, they're still. Something's moving here, you know, I can tell something. But they're very, very comfortable, you know. When it comes to the next intensity, 5.5 watts per kilogram, 
that's where you see the junior seconds are gone, the amateur seconds can only hang in there for 30 seconds or so. These guys are really, really, really hurting and start getting dropped in the world class. So that, that's when they're, they're starting to do some effort, you know, and eventually we move to the next level. Six watts per kilogram, you know, and that's where there are only like two or three guys left. So everybody's gone here, except for like the two or three guys that are really hurting. So anyways, we can predict this in the laboratory and we can predict performance and where everybody is. Same thing we can do in other sports. So this is just like a, a panel different sport. This is college, uh, bus, I mean college football. This is the test we increase on the treadmill, uh, like a half mile per hour at a time. So the effort gets uh, harder and harder. And we can see here the football players, right off the bat, are horrible. You know, uh, 5.5 miles an hour is that is the first intensity, you know, they're from here, you know, and uh, one of the things is people say, ah, but I'm not a marathon runner, you know, I don't need, I don't need to see a lactate, yeah, but, you know, like, in the football, you produce so much lactate in the competition, this is nearly competition intensity, you know, and uh, not even here is competition intensity, they really need to remove lactate very quickly to do it over and over again, you know, and, uh, but that's why I tell okay, you're not a marathon runner, okay, let's compare you with What's the athlete you would be comparing the most? You know? How do you remove that? Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's, it's a, the, the, in order to remove lactic acid, if you have to rather, I think you remove the mitochondria. I'm going to show you here in a second. If you give me the test, like that. Yeah. But, uh, but anyways, I, I showed it with, uh, with, uh, with sprinters, you know, like look at the sprinter, you know, where you are like a, a lactic person, that is really hard. The sprinter is, you know, pretty much still watching TV, you know. Uh, so that's the whole thing, you know, and that's where you can prove, you can prove it with a pro soccer player, right? It's better than the sprinter, way better than the football player. Look at the huge differences. These guys are, are done, and these guys are still, eh, it's okay, you know? Uh, the basketball players, they're similar to the pro. This is a pro with basketball players, you know? The pro soccer players, they're not that different, you know? Then we see that uh, the, the, the basketball, this is the, the pro team, right? Good top protein, um, European level, which basically they're getting better and better, and, and they're probably better than, than Americans at this point. And that's why I said the example of a Spanish national team versus the US. Um, but uh, this is the average college uh, uh, men's basketball team, you know, big differences here. This is where we're trying to work now with the, with the uh, CU basketball team, you know. And this is the women's basketball team, you know, the women's basketball team, we see they're very similar to the to the football team, you know, very similar. You know, for you can show that to them, you know. <laughs> but um, anyways, but this is what we're seeing, you know, and this is what how you know the metabolic response to exercise. So we can really see that these guys are not fit at all, you know, um, and these guys, yeah, you know, they need to improve too. Uh, look at the marathon runner. I don't even start counting anything, you know. So I start counting here, and the marathon runner up until uh, 11, 25 miles an hour, their metabolically speaking is like. For you and I, watch TV. This I can't even sprint eight miles an hour for eight seconds. This guy can, it can do this. Is, this is the marathon pace, twelve miles an hour. You know, that's unbelievable. You know, what are, what are these numbers? Are oh, no, this is lactic. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, lactic accumulation, lactic acid. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So resting levels are about one minute. You know, that's what we have here. This is this is what they guys have like twelve miles. I mean, uh, yeah, eleven point five miles an hour, which is incredible. Could you argue that you're comparing apples and oranges? For example, the football players have different muscle compositions yeah. and attention than the endurance people. Uh, they're looking at um, fast twitch versus yeah, slow absolutely. twitch muscle exactly. explosion yeah. versus. Yeah, you're, you're totally right. But the whole thing is like, as I'm going to show you in a second, the lactate is removed in the type 1 muscle fibers, which have a very high amount of fatty density. Uh, now, if, you, if you're like a, an, uh, an offense lineman, Right, and you're charging you, uh, and you go back to the sidelines, and you go back to the sidelines with 12 millimoles of lactic acid. You know, if you have while well, you're in recovery, if you have a very good type one muscle fibers, the question you in that five minutes or three minutes, you're you're removing lactic very efficiently. You go out there and you go out with maybe three millimoles, right? I suppose that and this is what happens. They because they never train with muscle fibers. You know, it's always sprinting and weightlifting, and sprinting and lifting. Then they go back out there. They go to the silos with 12 minerals, they go back out there with 11. You know, so they cannot do it, you know, and that's when they get crushed, you know. Uh, so that's very important. That's why the concept that they're still in the football, they don't get it, you know, it's, it's all about high intensity, high intensity, uh, and weights, you know, and, and that's what we can improve this year. And that's why I tell them, hey, look, look, look at your sprinter. 
this printer, you know, look at this, it's a hundred of millimeters printer, but what happens, like, they go one way, right? I mean, one, one, one set, you know, and they go in and they have to recover, and they have to do it again, and they recover, and they have to do it again, that's what training. So, the fresher you are, the more you improve, you know, those, those neuromuscular adaptations, you know, so that's why even these guys they have to have good lactic experience capacity. Okay. Um, can you explain these numbers a little bit differently? Um, are these serum levels or yes, these, these are blood blood analysis, capillary blood. We use uh, uh, from the from the earwalk or the fingertip. Yeah, this capillary blood. Is are these numbers normalized for uh, weight per yes. yeah. Per, yeah. per athlete? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the whole thing too is like you know going back to, to basketball as well. You know uh, the basketball like. If, the, if you want to prepare this guy, and this is what, the, what I'm going to show you here, this is the basketball. This is one of the teams that I worked in Europe with. Uh, uh, so this is one of the, one of the tough teams over there. Uh, so we see that we do this, the treadmill and then we increase 1.5 1, 1. miles per hour. And this is the typical Spanish player, professional player, and this is the lactate response. Not very good at all. Uh, these guys are former NBA players that they can find a team over here, they find an accommodation over there, right? Uh, physiologically speaking, they're very similar. Their condition is very poor. They're lacking, they're actually not lacking very efficiently. Now, these four guys over here, they're guys who uh, came here to the US to play NBA. You know, they played a very high level, right? Look at the, the, the differences here. You know, especially when we look at here, for example, 40 miles an hour, these guys are pretty dry, and these guys are slightly above resting levels. Big differences here, right? So this means that. Well, maybe it's not all about skills, right? Like this guy can have as good skills or even better than this guy. But in the fourth quarter, this guy's going to be done, you know, for sure. Where this guy's going to be going and going and going, you know. Fatigue also, when there's a lot of acidosis as well, the brain cannot be so um, um, uh, focused. You know, there, there are different studies showing fatigue and uh, uh, muscle contraction, reaction, uh, reaction time. Uh, 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 efficiency and yeah, when you're fatigued, you know, everything goes down. You know, so of course, these guys are going to be the fourth quarter way more. So imagine you would have a team where you know the five guys are playing out there, it's like this, versus the five life guys playing here, they're here. So it's, it's a whole different game, you know. And that's uh, that's uh, what's happening, for example. Like, I, I, I kept talking about that, for example, the Spanish national team, you know, uh, that more and more, you know, they're using these methodologies and they're getting to these levels. They play at a higher level, you know, they're not skilled yet, right, but they, they can still be there, you know, and this is one example of how you can improve this, so this is, this is number one guy out of, uh, out of college, right, here in the U.S., he went and played to play to the Lakers, number one draft out of college, I'm sorry, so horrible parameters here, six months per hour, it's really, really bad, and, and, and the guy couldn't even move, you know, he, he every two minutes he hits us up, because he can couldn't, you know, and he said, oh, it's my, my back, you know, it's back problems, you know, hey, they, they, you know, we sent them to the best back specialist in Spain, nobody found anything, all kinds of uh, imagery diagnosis, test, uh, we sent them to the best guy in Europe, nobody, we sent them here to the U.S., to the top guy who works for all the places, I don't find anything, you know, and I told the coach, this guy's right, he can't even do anything, you know, so yeah, eventually, the guy couldn't do anything, so they had to get rid of him, so he had a two-year contract, so, they transferred him to a minor uh, team in the, in the Netherlands, and he went with a specific training plan to improve this condition, right? So here is next year, a training camp again. Look at the differences here. Whole different plan, you know? So we're here, with two minimums of lactate, it's just about resting levels. Whereas here, he was fried. So of course, the guy can come up in that amount of reality. He was a whole different animal, you know? So this is what we can really do with, with athletes, you know? Uh, so what was this I'm sorry? What, what is it? Uh, uh, what's his name now? Uh, it's just that. Uh, I can't remember now. Uh, you look at look at the number one draft of a college in 1997 or 96 or 97, one of the Lakers. I don't remember that. Anyways, but uh, so yeah, big differences we can do with, with athletes, you know. Uh, also, not just individual sports, but when we were talking to, uh, to teams, you know, back in the days, so this is what I was saying, I've been doing this for a few years, this is way in the days, and uh, team sports said, ah, we don't need this, this only applies to right, cyclists and runners and triathletes, but now, that's where the team sports, you know, they, they started to open the doors, and now, 
all the top team sports over there, especially in soccer and basketball, they have this exercise physiology human performance labs inside their stadium, so the training facilities, you know, and this is what is happening here for sure, you know. Um, anyways, you can see the evolution of like cycles over time when he's 16 years old. So this is the exercise intensity increases. We put it in the laboratory, we increase the exercise intensity. This is in watts per kilogram, right? And it gets harder and harder. So this is the lactate response that very good when he starts 16 years old and all the way when he's a pro tour, which is an NFL professional, you know, big differences here, you know. So we can track the improvements here from eight millimoles. 2.7 millimoles. Uh, the whole myth of the VO2 max, for example, this is a cycle that in two years, professional cycles, 72.2, 72.7, no improvement in VO2 max, huge improvements in performance, right? So if you just do VO2 max, you measure that, you probably have a lot of numbers from the metabolic car, and you can say, well, you have an improved max. Yeah, but that's not true, because I've improved a lot more, not, not metabolically speaking. Well, we look at lactate, for example, and yes, that's what we should do. You know, that's where you can see that at 4.5 watts per kilogram, it was 5.4 millivolts, and now it's 1.7. You know, big differences here, no change in the view 2 max. That's why the view 2 max is an art, and certainly doesn't really make the difference. You know, the adaptations are the same that, you know. And, um, and this is what also we also do all the other brothers that can let us know about what's going on at the cellular level. So, this is the, the cell, and inside the cell, this is the mitochondria, right? This is where we process the energy. Okay. In the mitochondria, that will be burned to glucose and fatty acids. So, uh, this is the methodology that I'm using here. So, this is this is uh, uh, the exercise intensity. This time it's translated into heart rate. So, as exercise intensity gets higher and higher, you know, you, your heart rate gets higher, right? And that's this is like the, the carbohydrate oxidation or burning of, of glucose, and this is the fat burn, which is here. So, as exercise intensity increases, it gets harder, you need more glucose. And this is in grams per minute. So you use more glucose, and this is the fat curve. So many times the fat curve, right, what it does, it just increases a little bit here and then decreases and it flattens. This is a very interesting point that we use. This is the fat max. This is the exercise intensity at the one you uh, elicit the highest fat oxidation. So, for example, this is what we're doing now with our weight loss programs. You know, many people go to the weight, I mean, to the gym. And they just kill themselves literally, and they, and they die, and they sometimes they can't lose the weight or keep it steady, right? They're not training the right intensity. They're training here, always here. They burn no fat, and that's what we can tell them. Hey, you have to start here. This is where you burn the most fat, for example. You know, so um, where? Yeah, this is heart rate. Heart rate. Heart rate. Heart rate. Heart rate. Yeah. So anyway, so this is where we put down this heart rate, you know. But but that person might always go 150, 160. So there's no fat burning here. So that's what we can really that I you know, um, um, this is a crossover point where you switch over. Uh, so that's for every person. Exactly, so this is where I'm going to go here. So this is this is difference, for example, this is your typical uh, recreational athlete. Actually, this is your typical Colorado freak. You know, <laughs> just doing marathons, and hiking, and all that. So we look at the, at the, at the fat response, increase a little bit, peaks here, and eventually you know, our plummets here and disappears here. This is the fat, right? And the glucose here is increasing the value of this is a world class athlete. The world class has assets, it keeps going higher and higher and higher, and it peaks at a much higher intensity, right? And peaks, and even when they plummet, they're still are higher than the highest point here. Big difference here, right? And this is this is this is very, very important. The whole thing is a very efficient metabolic speaking, they use a lot of less glucose for energy purposes. So for example, um, here this guy, you know, is this intensity is 1.7 grams per minute of glucose. You know, 2.7, 3 grams per minute, you know, almost twice as much glucose. So, this is one of the things that we can dive into nutrition. With this, for example, recreational athletes, hey, I want to prepare for a marathon, I want to dive into my nutrition. How many grams per hour or per, per, per mile should I have? You know, and that's what we can say, well, at this, we can first give them the marathon pace. And we can really predict with looking at this per month, how many what parameters. I can predict marathon, and I'm not a, a witch or anything, you know, but I can predict my word for I mean, I can predict marathon time with like three minutes up and down, you know, and I can tell you the pace that you are going to be at, you know. So that's one of the things that, and therefore we can see also the grams per minute of glucose that you need to have as well, you know. So we can, we can predict a lot of things. How do you measure causality? For example, one example, um, how much is attributable to genetics versus training yeah. regimen? Yeah, that's a good point. 
And, uh, and as I always say, to be at the world class level, you have an amazing genetic pool. But you need to really work at 100%. So it's about 100% genetics, 100% work. You know? <laughs> very difficult, right? To be uh, at a very high level, not world class, but high level, you need genes, but it's work. It's hard work. And this is what I, when I, when I told Atlas, going back to the slides that I showed earlier, you know, you can say, hey, these are the effects of performance. You know, uh, if you utilize all these perfectly or close to perfection, you will be up there for sure. If you don't, you might have good genes, but that's all that. You know. But can you measure it? For example, there is this uh, high yeah. jumper who had been high jumping for you know over a decade, and he became world class and one of the best, if not the best. And then there's this guy who, by accident, he was um, in college, and, and somebody asked him to do a jump, and he jumped, and it turns out genetically he was yeah. an incredible jumper. And the next summer, this guy who had been jumping for maybe six months went and beat the world class high jump. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I mean. You know, those are the guys that had different genes, you know. And we're also talking about sports where, like, to start with, there are not that many high jumpers in the world. You know, uh, there's a very small pool of athletes. So it's much easier to break through to good genes, you know, as opposed to, for example, uh, professional cycling or, or baseball, you know. Or, you know what I mean? For, for each, they're, they're way more plus baseball players. So the genetics, therefore, it's, a, it's way more competitive. But I'm curious, is there a scientific way to measure? Yes, what there is. A, if a person's performing basically on yeah. genetics there's, superiority there's, versus somebody who maybe have close, yeah. but not as much ways to, working on it. There's ways to measure the genetics, but there's no way they can predict if you're going to be more class or this. In the first one, we don't have a, a genetic data. Base, you know, but what all the world class in this sport have, yeah, all the world class in this sport have, you know, we're not there yet, you know. But so that's why I say you can say, yeah, you have good genes to be a marathon runner and you have good genes to be a high jumper. Now, that doesn't mean that it's fixed because we know through the epigenetics, you know, right, that hey, the genetics are controlled by the environment, so you can improve a lot of things, you know. So, uh, this is the other example of someone who go from the you know, uh, the recreational athlete in the world class and still compare another recreational and uh, this is the someone who is pretty much a sedentary individual, you know, like doesn't do much. Uh, it's a very physically inactive person. So they burn very little fat and a very low exercise intensity already broke. There's no fat expansion, you know. And this happens because of the mitochondria. And this is what I'm going to show you here. So in the cell, the type 1 muscle fibers, that's where you burn the fat. The only place in the whole body where you burn fat is the mitochondria. In the mitochondria also, that's where you, you, you clear out the lactic acid. Right? So it's an amazing power complex, the mighty mitochondria. So we know very well that the world class athletes they have the highest mitochondria than humans, like oranges, you know, they're huge, you know, and they have a very good lactic acid capacity. This is the lactate, right? And this is the fat. And they have also a very good fat oxidation capacity. We see that the amateur athletes, they have a good overall lactic acid capacity, and they have an okay or good you know, uh, fat oxidation capacity, and they have a medium mitochondrial intensity in number. Uh, we know that the obese or type 2 diabetics, they have something that is called a mitochondrial dysfunction. Those mitochondria are not working properly, therefore they cannot burn fat appropriately, and they cannot burn black either. And this is one of the things that we're doing research and also doing applications already for these populations with obesity and type 1 diabetes. You know, and that's about what we want to do is improve mitochondrial content and density. So if we improve in a type 2 diabetic, 90% uh, of type 2 diabetes is, is acquired. Only 10% is a genetic. You know, so and, and out of the 90% acquired, pretty much everything could be physical inactivity. There's a mitochondrial dysfunction. So if you, in the mitochondria, it's also where you burn the glucose. If the mitochondrial dysfunction is not the glucose, so it builds up. It leads to uh, insulin resistance and eventually type 2 diabetes. Uh, and also, and that will link in the uh, cardiovascular disease to type 2 diabetes. Yeah, the fat cannot be burnt either. So you have a, an accumulation, and you have a huge problem, metabolically speaking. And that's something that's called metabolic inflexibility. You know, has anybody heard about that term? So you guys would have heard about it because yeah, this is this is this is a huge metabolic problem. You know, and that can lead to other other diseases. So, anyways, that we know very well that. The, uh, the world class athletes, the people of world class, they need, especially leading your athletes, are the only population in the world where 100% of them, 100% of 
they're free of being acquired metabolic disease like type 2 diabetes doesn't exist. And yet, there is a population in the world who by far have the highest carbohydrate in simple sugars of humans. You know? uh, so, but they're incredibly flexible. You know, they have all these mitochondria they can really use for process uh, all kinds of uh, energy sources. And that's what is called metabolic flexibility. You know? So anyway, so that's what we can really tailor specific training programs uh, for, type one, for type 2 diabetes, for metabolic syndrome, even cardiovascular disease patients. So applying the same methodology that we do in the athletes. So that's something that we're doing at the Nationals uh, Management Campus. Uh, the other thing that we, we, we track down also is the overtraining. You know, it's something that is, 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 is not very well done yet. You know, we're not there yet. So many athletes, you know, they train more than what they can simulate. Go back to the measurement. You don't know how much you can simulate. You, you think that you're super, especially you're young, you can go for everything, but you cannot assimilate some time. And many times trainers and coaches they don't even know how much an athlete is training and can see you know? they were, It's in a great unknown out there. There's an assumption that a specific training program is going to work. For example, team sports, everybody trains the same. Everybody. And we know that the genetics are different. You know? I and mean, we know because we measure in the laboratory that wow, this guy is going differently, right? And that's something you know, this is an assumption, you know, like so what we're doing actually sometimes we're hurting someone and we're not giving enough stimulus to others to improve, right? So that's something is so, so many times you know, in leader retrain happens, some people suffering from retrain, they don't even know it. And the, the main reason why they didn't even know it, going back to the measurement, to the analytics, you know, they never find out, you know, so they keep going. And they live in a world where like, oh, how many times do we hear, you know, like people get you know get up in the morning and they're like, oh, I'm dead, I'm so happy, you know, but I have a trial, but I'm supposed to be tired, right? No, you're not. The best trial in the world, they're never tired. Oh, really? Oh, they, they're recovering. You're like, oh, man, that's a new thing to me. You know, like, they never find out. It's actually through more analysis. You think, like, oh, my God, I'm going to You know, this is a huge population that is growing. I'm not talking here about elite athletes. You know, every, every year, every every uh, event, maybe, maybe like a 10K, a 5K, like a, a marathon, a triathlon, breaks records of participation. You know, every year, you know, and it's getting to, to it's getting so popular now among everybody, you know, because that, 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 that recreational athlete that who used to go around the block, you know, just for the fun of it and run a little bit, now that, that person has become a competitive athlete of his own. You know, now they train with a purpose. They want to be their personal record. They want to qualify for whatever. They want to be the fastest in their neighborhood when they climb, you know. So they, they train with a purpose and they get on the train, you know. And that's something that they ensure all these. All these events. You know, many of these events are before, up until very recently, you could sign up up until not the same day. You could sign up for the event. Now they announced the opening you know, for signing up for that event five months ago and two hours sold out. You know, it's, it's incredible. You know, so it's more difficult to get to enter in those events than if, if you two comes tomorrow to get tickets for the concert. You know, it's, it's crazy. But anyways, but but yeah, so many times they get over trained, you know, and they're understanding many times the principles of training. So we have the overload, the frequency, intensity, specificity, recovery, super compensation. So it's not that easy. It's not just, oh, I'm going to train and see how it goes. So it's very, so when you train, you're losing a stimulus, and you're going to get tired, right? You're going to get fatigued, and then you're going to recover. And when you recover, you have a super compensation. So you have an evolution, but then you do it again. So eventually, what happens is like, if you have a good, positive super compensation, you get better and better and better, right? But many times that either because of the training stimulus is too much or the recovery is not enough, right? That is, this stimulus is too much or maybe the recovery is not enough, then you get in these situations. We have a negative supercompensation. And that's what people get overtrained. You know, and this is something that is not measured in so many sports, you know? Uh, and that's something we can do, you know? On top of that, there are other factors, so excessive training, for recovery, but other factors like nutrition, like psychological stress, you know, they can really affect performance and recovery, right? So that's one of the things that we need to do and apply a scientific approach. So for example, going back to keep measuring things, metabolic testing, we look at these guys, we gain watts per kilogram, we increase exercise intensity, we do a test in July, and in July this is the lactate, the millimoles. The lactate is not so good, we see in September, mm, that's much better, that's an improvement, right? We have a different athlete, right? And, and we do the test, and in July, it's here, right? I'm sorry, in July, it's here, and in September, it's here. It got worse. We know, so wow, what did it go wrong? And that's where we look at what's the training program with this guy, and that's what we can change them, because we can still make mistakes, of course, you know? And that's what we can change that we know, otherwise, this guy gets worse and worse and worse. 
you know? So that's what we find out in the laboratory. The other things that we do is that uh, it's very important to, to prevent our training before it happens, you know? So for that, we have to diagnose it on time. And one of the things, you know, it's very important to, it's an incredible important tool that we have around us, you know? And we need to have the same critical approach, and the answer is in the blood. And that's where we do a bunch of different mode analysis and biomarkers, indicators of physiological problems and conditions there. So we look at blood analysis, hematological, um, we look at uh, bi biochemical or chemi chemical um, things in the blood, um, parameters, hormonal, and even serological. So we can really get a very, very good idea. So for example, going back to the analytics, right, that Tony was doing, we can see that the number of one player going down, why? The coaches don't know. He showed that to the coaches, and the coaches scratched their heads and kind of like, hmm, what might be that? We have identified a problem, but we don't know exactly what's going on, you know? And that's how we may see different problems, you know? Here in the world, maybe that, that, that player's knee, maybe, maybe, maybe he or she has muscle damage, you know, and then we can be corrected. Maybe the nutrition is not right, you know? And that's what we can correct that. Are there specific biomarkers that yes. identify psychological effects on the body? Yeah. And so those have been identified and clearly uh, used well, to that's a that's a, yeah, um, um, that's a that's a field that there's not much research on that, you know, but uh, um, I mean we we we're, we're to a point that the ABCs are not done yet. So, you know, and, and sometimes I will say that if you're tired, you're fatigued because you have something wrong here, yeah, it's gonna affect your head. Sure, you know, you, you lose concentration, you, you don't recover as well, you know. So, you know, you, you, I think that you can measure psychological parameters, and there's there's some, some uh, like omega waves that is a way that captures heart rate and, and, and brain function, but uh, it's not, it's very general. So, yeah, you're, you might be depressed, you know, or you might not be focused by why, we don't know yet, but that's what we come here, we know why. You know, so for example, one of the things is hemoglobin inside the red blood cells. So the red blood cells deliver oxygen, right? Is a taxi of the of oxygen. And hemoglobin, which is inside the red blood cell, is the seat for the oxygen seats, right? So every day we destroy 200 billion and B uh, red blood cells. So we have to replace them, right? If we train too much or we don't recover enough, sometimes we cannot replace as much as we lose. So we enter the deficit, right? Hemoglobin. And that's what we can measure. So this is what I call the optimal performance frame. And this is what I do with athletes worldwide. Um, you know, like on a monthly basis, we do more analysis, right? And we can see the hemoglobin. This is hemoglobin in numbers. Let's say an average is about 15 so grams per deciliter. So you, we should be fluctuating with an optimal performance levels. But many times it doesn't happen. And this is what happens many times. So an athlete starts here, and the next month is here. The next month is here, increasing intensity, duration, maybe games, maybe competition, everything is good, but for whatever the reason, boom, one month goes down. That's what we can detect. We can intervene, we can correct. And we can see here that, for example, one gram of hemoglobin transports 1.34 milliliters of oxygen. So this is your oxygen carrying capacity when you're here. When you decrease to one point, your oxygen carrying capacity is by 7%. Pro altitude in the mix, you know, many times we pay too much attention to the marginal things, that 1% that is going to make us faster and better, and we spend a lot of money because we can touch it, you know, the we don't really lose this completely, you know. And this is only one point, but this is what happens many times. So the player starts here, or the athlete, you know, and for whatever the reason, you, this could be many, many trips together, you know, maybe there's like a stretch of like seven games away, uh, maybe not enough recovery, or maybe training too much, whatever. You name it or not, good nutrition. Many of the players that were working, you know, they leave training practice and they go to McDonald's. Professional athletes, for sure, huh? You know, and uh, it's so frustrating, you know, because they need a lot of education. So, yeah, all these things can happen. So, one of the things that happens if you don't detect it here, you know, this guy keeps free falling, right? And eventually it's here. And guess what happens here? This is where the playoffs are. This is where the most important part of the season comes, you know. And this is only one team. I mean, one player is not a tight team. So years ago, when I came here, I tested, I'm not going to name the team, but I tested the top four players on the team after the regular season. Or they did a horrible season. All the players were here. Neto, oh my gosh, imagine the rest of the team, you know. So of course, that's one of the reasons why, hey, it's the coach's fault. It's not the coach. Well, the players are right, period, you know. So it's one of the things that we see is here, it's uh, you know, if we go from here to here, the oxygen carrying capacity decreases by 15%. So you better pack them all home if you're here. 
They have nothing to do, nothing to do in terms of performance. You know? uh, many times it's not not the current capacity, it's at the muscle level. So this is a uh, this is where muscle contracts, this is sarcomer, and this is where you produce a contraction here. Uh, this is glycogen over here. This is the muscle lateralis, muscle biopsis. This is before a marathon, and this is the same muscle after a marathon. There's an important muscle destruction here. Now, the main reason I show you this is that you don't have to perform a marathon to be here. Excessive training, full nutrition, full recovery is going to get you here. Right? Now, guess what? Through biomarkers, we can get to know this because when you have uh, some muscle damage, you get, you get a very similar picture like this. You know, this, is, this picture over here, it's past muscle fiber, it's even in marks. And we see this is the muscle fiber, this is the other muscle fiber, and this, are my, this is my corruption. That doesn't, mean you, that doesn't mean you're injured. The muscles are functioning perfectly, but you already have a micro here. So therefore, your, your, your strength, your power is going to a lot. Imagine a basketball player in the court like this, you know? It's not, it's not going to have the same fatigue, I mean, the same reaction time, power, speed. And there's research on this, provoking muscle, uh, muscle damage on purpose, measuring different reaction times, power, speed, before and after, 50% less, you know? Different studies. So, but there are different enzymes in the muscle, different biomarkers that escape to the blood. And in the blood, we can quantify the degree of muscle damage. So we can see, wow, well, yeah, your muscles, because we don't we don't detect any biomarkers in the muscle, in the blood, your muscles are here. Or oh my god, you're here for sure, and you're here to do that now. And that's what we can prevent it. This is for example one football team. This is what we've done this year. So uh, training camp. This is I give this to the coaches like a, an index, so I don't give the number of biomarkers that they need to get their ball because I just make a team and I say, hey, blue is no damage, your player is perfect. Uh, yellow is mild damage. Orange is moderate damage, you already have a slight risk of injury. Red is very poor damage. So here and here the, the, the performance starts going down and you have moderate risk of injury. And uh, here, very high damage and very high risk of injury. You're going to get injured almost for sure. You're going to have problems. So, we started a uh, training camp. They're here. They come here and they already have mild damage at training camp. You know? And uh, I, I've been observing these 14 players who have been having the highest incidence of muscle damage, right? This is the summary of the year. So, we have first week of a season. They're here in poor muscle damage. You know? Halfway through the season, you know? Very high. Yeah, this, this is very high degrees of muscle damage and injury. You start getting injured players here. And that's why, first, you know, because these methodologies are known for, for football coaches at first, or strength conditioning coach, like, man, I need to do that. And that's why I, I get together with them. And, hey, you guys cannot do this. You know, this is, this is going to be the core we have. We're going to have the entire team is going to go bankrupt. And, uh, and the whole thing is going to get injured. We're showing the performance is here. The thing in team sports is like, you can't detect this on the field. If you, and I told them, if you're an individual athlete, doesn't matter if you're a marathon runner or a 100 meter sprinter, I told them, you're screwed. If you're here, you're done. There's nothing you can do. You know, you're going to be two seconds slower in the 100 meter sprint. You know, um, and you're going to quit a marathon. But you can see it because it's an individual sport. In a team sport, you can lose it. You don't even know. You know, and that's what I told them, you know, so hey, let's do this, let's do that. For example, this guy will lift and lift and there's a whole obsession in football, obsession in lifting, no matter what, who will be for it, who will be lift. These guys, for example, they cannot lift in two weeks, which is unthinkable in football, unthinkable. Two weeks without lifting, you know, and there's the results. The last quarter of the season was here, the end of the season was here. This is the reference, this is the only scientific study I've seen in, in football. This is when, when you finish a game, they're here. So they were 48 hours after a game, I'm sorry. So they've been training at the same intensity after a the game, you know. So that's why you see that the last quarter of the season here, the end of the season is here. Or they finished the season way better than the year before. And, uh, and the number of injuries decreased three times. So they used to have about 100 missing games per season. That's the way they measure injuries. They should have 30. Big difference, you know. That we measure. They had never done this before. They would get bored and bored and bored, you know. And that, that's one of the things that we can do also, of course, in, in, in team sports. And again, individual sports, you, you can tell. You, you, you can keep up with okay, something is wrong, what's going on, get dropped, etc. Team sport, you do it, you know. Uh, other things that we can do is free radicals. Um, you know, this is like a, I mean, one of the section teams Garmin at the team bus, and just right when they get to the bus, you know, after the stage, and just look at the, the free radicals, for example. 
and this is like a, a, a tour of Spain, so three three week event. Uh, this is the number of free radicals, the units, sports. That's how the units we use, and this is the day. So the first stage, or this this is a normal number. Okay, just this is a normal number. Uh, this is like a five days into the race, they increase the free radicals. The free radicals, what they do, they damage cells, right? And uh, they damage a lot of cells, and especially they damage red blood cells and they damage muscle cells. And for that, we have the antioxidants. Antioxidants, they uh, uh, fight up uh, free, uh, free radicals, right? So we see a high, higher number of free radicals. We start intervening, giving more antioxidants, and we, we decrease the free radicals a little bit. And that's towards the end. Of the, of the stage race, you know, they seem to have three hard days of mountains, very, very, very hard, you know, and that's when they go up, you know, and we keep increasing, and then that's when we double the dose of antioxidants here, and then we can have it here. So that's something that we can also monitor, you know, and now, for example, we see that, hey, they start the first day with this dose, so they're going to be here, they're going to have this, this muscle damage, you know, and their performance will improve, you know, that's something that we do. We can also measure. You know, the same way that Tommy was doing with analytics, you know, we can also measure different parameters, you know, uh, from anywhere in the world. You know, now athletes, they have these garments where they have like a power monitor, they have a computer bike on the, on the watch, so they download it to a computer, and we get, or, or, or soccer, they have the mic coach, or the, the football, the catapult, different metrics and analytics that we use, and we can see, you know, the maximum heart rate of that day, the amount that he's doing his training, so the meters or, or miles have run, etc. etc. We can do the same thing or, or similar, you know, to what Tommy was showing, uh, but it takes time, you know, uh, to, to do this. But uh, anyway, so we can look at also uh, one mountain stage. We can analyze different parameters. You can see here, this is a one by one flag stuff. I don't know if you follow cycling, but the Tour of Colorado two years ago finished on top of the flag stuff in, in Boulder. So this is the guy who won that stage, and we can see, you know, his numbers for what he won. You know, the watts, the average, the speed, the pace, the heart rate, the cadence. You know, obviously we can analyze as well. You know, uh, and just finally with the nutrition, it's another thing that we can also measure. You know, uh, it's not uh, something that you know many going back to our same example. They go to McDonald's, many of the players high in the world, you know, in front of McDonald's. You know. And uh, so they don't know. It's, it's a lot of education. They're professional athletes, you know. So uh, anyway, so there's nutrition. Many times, many times, it's just triggers over training. So there are a bunch of elements to watch for. But I'm just going to focus on carbohydrates, you know, because it's a big, big topic out there, you know. So we know very, very well from research, extensive research done a long, long time ago, right? So these are put together. These two research here. So we know that uh, glycogen. This is where we store carbohydrates. We eat carbohydrates and we store them in the muscles mainly in the form of glycogen, right? And then we can mobilize them when we need them. The problem with glycogen is a very small deposit. Very, very, very small deposit. Fat, right, is a very big deposit. You know, fat is the diesel gas. And that even the kidneys individual in the world have has about 50 to, to 100,000 calories worth of fat stored. So they're never going to run out of fat. The problem with fat is as exercise intensity increases, you cannot synthesize energy fast enough. So it's, you cannot use the fat, you use the, the carbohydrates, right? The problem with carbohydrates is that the deposit is very, very small. You know? Does anybody know how many, how, what's the deposit of, of glycogen in the bodies? Approximately. So it's about somewhere, it depends on the size, but somewhere between 50 and 500 grams, that's it. Under a pound of glycogen that we store. Very small deposit. So we have to make sure we have it there. And that's what we have the research, like so many research from the last 40 years have been coming out. And every single research shows that if you have more glycogen content, your performance is going to be low. You know, not a single research supports the bottom line. Right, you know? So we know that this is a glycogen content and sort of food carbohydrate diet. And this is like a 75% of the V2 max intensity that is race based in a marathon, for example. And we can see that they will muscle biopsies like poking the chunk of muscle and analyzing it every 20 minutes. In about 80 minutes, you'll run out of glycogen. You'll run. And this is a high glycogen content. Imagine if you start here, you're going to go fast. You know? The problem is, like, also in, in team sports, for example, it's a high intensity. You know? So the rate of depletion is even faster because you use it. Right? So that's why it's critical to have good glycogen content and good nutrition. You know? This is what happens if, uh, again, we use the glucose in the fat. You know? And that glucose, you know, it's a story in terms of glycogen in the liver and the muscle. So this is where we store the glycogen in the liver, right? This little block that's right here, right? 
and uh, in the muscle. 85% is in the muscle, right? And 15% of the liver. So when, uh, what happens when before a competition with a good carbohydrate diet, this is the glycogen gradients. These are mitochondria, but these are glycogen over here. This is before and this is after. See? There's a glycogen depletion, right? So after training or a competition, we have to go back to work, right? Uh, the thing is that many people, they might even start a competition here. Because now the new thing is like all carbohydrates is working, you know? We know that it's still the way around. You really need carbohydrates to exercise, especially at the highest level. So many times, you know, people start either don't recover or they compete here. And this is the problem. If you this is the muscle, if you have more glycogen content, right? You have some depletion here. And especially if you're high intensity exercising, like like this a competition or hard training, you don't have enough glycogen. So how in the world you can sustain that extra such intensity? A car without oxygen or without gasoline, it stops. Humans don't stop. We keep going, right? So where in the world would we get energy from? We get energy because the fat at those intensities, you cannot get energy from the fat. You need the glucose part, you know? So where do you get it? You get it from the muscle protein. The muscles, the muscle protein can be synthesized to different amino acids and branching amino acids to the nature and can be transformed to glucose. So it can be glucose as well. The problem is you pay a big price because the muscle starts eating itself to feed itself. So then you release it a catabolic situation, right? And this is what happens here, that picture that I throw here. You know, so you can get to this level just by having a full nutrition, you know? And that's what we see it. We see a lot of athletes who have muscle damage they don't train that much, you know, but they were street carbohydrates because someone told them or their neighbor, they ran an internet or whatever, right? So we know that, and that's something that, uh, yeah, it's not, it's not acceptable because the performance will increase. But we know this because we measure, you know, we measure the, the muscle damage, you know? So uh, we know for sure that low carbohydrates plus competitive training and competition, it's going to lead to overtraining 10 out of 10 times. Period. <laughs> you know, and uh, that's something that happens there. You know, uh, so we did another study because we're starting to work more in looking at glycogen. We did a small study looking, and we used uh, a total of 90, 99 quotative uh, sites made in women. So we were starting to some indirect forms of looking at glycogen content, and we 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 had some cutoffs or so. We we, we saw that thirty percent of men and twenty four percent of women they had some optimal glycogen content. You know, that's about a third, you know, so it's not just a small number, that's about a third. And, and we see a lot of these people out there, a lot, you know, so one third of these people, and, and that's something that is everywhere, you know, uh, they, they didn't know, and they thought that they were eating that carbohydrates, because many times they're not restricting them, they think that they simply, they think they have enough, but they don't, so yeah, it's one third of everybody out there. So you can have the best genes, you know, but if you can have the right nutrition, your genes are going to work. You can have a Ferrari gene, right? But you put diesel, it's not going to work. You know, same thing. You know, so that's very important. So, one of the things that we can we measure glycogen. Yes, we can measure it, and uh, this is what actually we're, we're doing tomorrow at the laboratory. We're going to take samples, you know, for uh, glycogen, and if any volunteer want to welcome to come, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's going to have a spark for life. But, <laughs> but anyways, but this is yeah, this is the way that we can measure glycogen, right? But of course, we're not going to put this to anybody. And especially to meet up and we'll throw you in jail, you know, to do this, you know. So I have developed with a co-worker of mine at the university, Dr. Hill. We have a, developed a way to measure glycogen using a, a non-invasive way based on a, a skeletal muscle high frequency ultrasound. So we can see that and we can throw up um, um, the, the, the ultrasound and we can have different readings. It's, it's, it's complicated to explain, but look at different readings, we analyze it pixel by pixel, the glycogen content, and we can see you know, this is the rectus femoris, long axis, and, and thorax of the same muscle. This is this muscle, the rectus femoris. And we can see the patterns of glycogen depletion, right? So that's what we can give a value. This is actually from the software. Now, in 15 seconds, we can measure glycogen, and the software is going to tell you if you're here, or if you're here, or if you're here. So you can act with nutrition. So many times, it's not just that you have to eat more. So we go, for example, uh, two days before the game, right? And two days before the game, we scan all the players. And uh, we see that we have now different professional teams using this. And uh, we see that some players are here today before the game. So you really need to focus on having full glycogen content for the D-Day. So we give them special, or we work with the, the team nutritionist, and hey, these guys are wrong. What happens with many, with many athletes? Like the two days before a game, that's they start decreasing the intensity of the training, and they get into the training mode. And the training mode, like, 
high level of food and carbohydrates, you know? And they're here. Like, no, no, you're fine. Just, you don't need to eat more. You're going to get more weight. You don't have it. No, you're, you're pretty good food. If you eat normal food, you're going to be okay, you know? And that's something that we, we, we do. And then we can tailor nutrition based on this, you know? So, anyway, this is another, another thing that I think we're going to hear a lot about this, hopefully, in the future, because this can, this can really, uh, you know, uh, do a lot of nutrition. Lastly, you know, I'm finishing this approach. So it's very important to look at the margin of gains. Um, now, these are tangible things. And you see a lot of people right now uh, uh, who are spending thousands of dollars on this. You know, so we have from the ice face, you know, it's going to decrease the core temperature. Uh, from my cryotherapy, you know, that's going to decrease your core temperature. So that's your 1%. Even the wind panel, you know, the space boots, this increase the blood flow, and increase recovery, you know, or even this is one. When cycling team was to France, they were using the, the mattresses. So they had a whole big truck with mattresses. They would go to all the hotels because for 21 days, you go from hotel to hotel, they would change the mattresses every day because the cycling team was to uh, sleep over to the Lucy mattress. And speaking of the general manager, it's, it's BS, you know, they didn't do much, you know. Or this team, you know, they had a whole, like a $1 million small truck with a cryotherapy chamber here. So all the cyclists after the race, you know, and the two of the friends would go here and they would stay there for a few minutes, you know, because that's when you put recovery. And it got in Europe a lot of media, you know, oh, this is the new thing, it's going to be this amazing. It was the worst team on the two of the friends. <laughs> so, <laughs> it didn't work. But, anyways, but I'm not saying that they don't work, you know, but I want to say this is, this is the 1%. But unfortunately, in order to get here, you need to do the ABCs. The ABCs are all these parameters over here. You know, is your, uh, you know, your margin, your real gains are here, the cellular level, the lactate, the fat oxidation, control the hemoglobin. That's where you get your, like, your 20%, your 15%, your 10% here as a 41%. You know, and that's why you can have the best genes. You don't utilize this. You can have the best genes, but if you utilize this, they're not going anywhere, you know? And that's something I did this for horses, for example. Like, a friend of mine is a, is a horse a veterinarian, you know, back in Spain. And, Horse, everything's about genetics, right? They pay because your father or your mother is the champion of this and champion of that. They pay millions based on your genetics, you know? Would you pay millions on uh, paying uh, money as uh, children? No, nobody would pay. Oh, you're oh, you guys paid money. Man, give your country a million dollar contract for that. No, that can happen. Why? Because we know that it's in the genes, and they might have to pay their parents' genes, you know? But, you know, so that's the whole thing. So with horses, I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to prove that, that these people are not riding the horses. So they didn't do anything. All the training the horses do is like they do two or three laps along the horse track. And that's it. And then, right? Then the, the race day comes, whoa, they go 100%. And, you know, yeah, sure. At the end of the day, whoever has the best genes, everybody trains the same. So, yeah, if you have the best genes, you're going to be out there. So we started to apply all these proportions. You know, we did physiological tests, lactate testing, hurry monitor, there's a hurry monitor for, for horses, and we do specific training, more analysis. Boom. And we, we, we bought one of the worst horses, never been tapped in ever, you know? And uh, we bought it for two months of March or something, nothing, you know? And we went to race day, and the horse was wholly different, so completely different, you know? And yeah, we won the race, you know? And plays top fives almost all the time, one four or five races, you know? And people would never live in Japan. We're trying to fly this, you know? But anyway, so that's the whole thing. You really need to do the ABCs before it gets to the, to the, to the, to the marginal gains, you know? So anyways, this is a summary that uh, if they get the specific training, it's important to maximize and utilize all the possible resources. We have to, 100% uh, uh, or more, utilize at least the genetic potential. Without specific training, no many of it's going to be immunization and other immunization. Number of trains are really known, affecting many athletes, should say athletes, and it should be addressed properly by professionals. And a true scientific training is necessary to make it to the next level. And if it's measured, it's managed. <laughs> okay, so if you guys have any questions. It's been quite an innovation in, you know, uh, personal health measuring devices, Fitbit and others. Uh, is there comparable innovation at the elite level where you can uh, more easily and frequently measure different important things like glycogen? Yeah, that's a, that's a, oh, well, glycogen was really good deal with, uh, with uh, high frequency for sound. Yeah, eventually that evolved to something else. A uh, huge field. Of course, not in sport, but uh, in, in, in health, is the whole biosensors, you know, the whole technology. So, I mean, in 10 years, you know, or 15 years, 
we're going to have a chip implanted here inside the skin, and it's going to measure your your triglyceride level, your cholesterol. When you have a heart attack, you know, because there's enzymes that escape from you and they come from the heart, and that's going to have like a through a um, this is a Bluetooth technology or AMT Plus technology, you know, and that can go, that's going to go to your mobile, to your doctor's office, or even to, even eventually to your uh, hospital. So you might have a heart attack, and boom, the hospital is detecting that before you fall out, you know, and that's proof you're going to have an ambulance in two minutes or five minutes, you know. So that's what we're going to revolutionize all health, you know. It's a huge, huge thing, and now you see. Uh, all the top companies in the world are doing this. And Apple is really investing a lot of money in these methodologies, you know. And of course, not for health, but for fitness performance, you know. Yeah, in 10, 15 years, well, this is going to be blown out of proportion. In, in, in a good way, hopefully, for us, you know. Now, are you going to be entering uh, your doctor's office and scan you for her, or you make work for me? You know, it's, it's going to be amazing. And it's going to happen for sure. Huh? Now I'm, I'm working with Taiwan Diabetics. Uh, we have a, we did athletes. We have a, we have a professional team there. All of them are Taiwan Diabetics. They have already a sensor under the skin and it's measuring glucose already. And that glucose goes through AMT Plus, goes to a, 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 to a, to a device that is it's, it's like this big only. And that device is slowly keeping track of the glucose. And when you go down, beep, 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 it beeps. When you go down, beep, 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 beep. So it's changing uh, diabetes lives, you know, but they have to keep poking all the time, you know, just, oh, my glucose is here. And that's that's a device. And that's going to get smaller and smaller and smaller, and that's going to go up to all the pills. Now, Google is, Google is also doing that as well. So Google now has developed a contact lens. You put it in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the AI, and it's still a prototype, and it measures glucose for diabetes, you know. So you just have that, and that is going to have incorporated some telemetry also, it can be incorporated to your Google Glasses or, or your iPhone or whatever, you know, and it's going to show here, oh, glucose is going down, oh, eat something, or, or glucose is high, boom, oh, use insulin. That's, that's, a, that's a fun ask, for sure. I think you covered a lot of it, but I was curious about what your thoughts are on some of the uh, benefits of calibration and automation by collecting data from many, many different subjects and combining them. Yeah. Like that's a very good question. That's exactly now what I what I I'm creating a big database, you know. And yeah, going like and I'm I'm, I'm trying to work and, and actually my company to try to uh, um, put together like a fitness watch or, or, or a more be more developed, you know, something that you can predict. You know how you have with watches, you know, that tell you your fat burning zone or calorie count, you know. But there's still you know not that those algorithms that haven't improved in 40, 50 years, you know, based on being too much only. Now throw in the lactate, the, the fat, the carbohydrate, the metabolism, we can create more fine, I mean more uh, you know, develop algorithms and use them, you know, so that's what we're working on. Yeah. That's a good question. Thank you. Is any of the state of Well, uh, that's what I'm trying to uh, work on now. You know, one of the that's a good question too, because one of the things I, I haven't published the majority of these, first because I didn't have much time. I'm working with so many hours, working in trouble and so much. And second, you don't get paid to publish it. Because that's, that's the advantage. You know? uh, teams don't, or athletes don't pay you to, hey, you know what, where, where your help and all these measurements, publishing out there so the others can copy us. That's what we do. That's what keeps it the edge. You know? So you usually get that. It's not that funny the same, but it is. a lot of things are very secret. Right? You don't see all the studies if possible and all the analytics because the teams, they keep it very secret. You know, uh, they don't want to. I'm not talking about uh, information on specific athletes, but uh, anonymous information for clinical, uh, clinical matters. Yeah, that, and that's what I picked to the community a few years ago, and that's what I really, really want to do. You know, uh, more for, for you know, this, the fat burning, I mean, the fat oxidation, the carbohydrate oxidation. Yeah, we're, we're working on doing that for sure. You know? The whole thing also is, is, is not just about publishing things from the athletes, it's, like, it's the methodology, right? You don't have to, you don't disclose the name, but if you show, oh, this is what we do with these athletes, the methodology, that maybe only two or three people are using it, you know? Then a hundred people are going to use it, and that's, that's what they can pay. It's unfortunate, but it is the way it is. But now, I mean, being now in the academia, I'm willing to now start releasing information. You know, that's what I really want to do. Uh, and it is funny because sometimes you go, because you travel a lot around the world and you go and 
if you know what this guy means something that I heard this guy made to you go, hey, are you measuring these levels of oxidation? No, I can't measure. What are you talking about? They don't, they don't tell you anything, of course, you know that he's doing it. You know? <laughs> oh, sure. Sometimes they ask me, hey, what's the hemoglobin when it decreases and goes down? And I'd be like, well, I don't know, I don't do that, man. <laughs> but of course, you know, I get paid for that, you know. So that's the whole thing, you know, like, uh, but yeah, they definitely want to release more information now. Especially with clinical things that we're doing, because yeah, now my main goal actually kind of here, not to the academia, is to, to bring many of these methodologies, right, to the, uh, to the, to the population, especially with chronic diseases, and use the, use the model of the lead athlete as the, the reference model of how perfect metabolism is, and try to explain faulty me metabolism problems in population like type 2 diabetes. And now I'm working on a, on a hypothesis with, with obese, with a, with a, with a type 2 researcher from Berkeley. We have an idea of what is the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes, what's the origin uh, based on certain different like metabolic responses here. We're using the model with the athlete, and then we're using all the way down, building a metabolic map you know, all the way to the type 2 diabetic. We need funding though. It's very difficult not to do research nowadays. Very, very difficult. Unfortunately. How much experimentation do you do with athletes? Because it seems to me that because we each have a different set of genetics and it reacts differently with the environment, one size does not fit all. So you're going to have to do a lot of experiments to find out what works for me won't work for Gary. Exactly, absolutely. And that's that's right and error. You know, that's why. When you start, you know, let's try this, this training methodology of this intensity or this and that, and like, oof, this doesn't work, you know, let's, let's, let's do more miles here, or more, more work at this intensity, or let's try to do nutrition or so, and eventually you get to know like, what happens, what, what works well. But you measure. Yeah, yeah, it's always measure. Exactly, right, that's the difference. Yeah, absolutely. I'm supposed to guess, you know, because to get from A point A to point B, by guessing, it might take you 10 years. If you measure, it might take you one year or two. A lot less. In terms of uh, your whole program, how much experimentation and how many years of work was it to build your generalized model? And how much additional work is it to create a more specific model for a specific act? Yeah, that's a very good question. So, I mean, I keep building it. You know, I've been 18 years doing this, you know, and, and I got to a point that, wow, I, I have a nice model, right? But I, I, I guess, and I don't know what, what's up next, right? But I'm going to keep working at these forever you know, measurements, you know. The thing now is a little frustrating is that, uh, yeah, you go with those methodologies from all these years, you go to some team sports, you know, or, or Atlas, and you show them that, they don't even see it yet, you know. So, like, how. Keep working when you already think that, oh, you know, and that's kind of frustrating. So let's stop here for now and, and eventually let's keep moving. Uh, can, you, can you try to make a guess on, let's say, how many hours? Is it 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 person hours uh, cumulative in the, uh, in the program, uh, including the analysts, the technicians, yeah. the clinic practitioners? Yeah. Well, that's oof. I mean, most of this job, of this work, I've done by myself. Unfortunately, you know, no help. You know, so it's been, you know, my wife can tell you there's like 70 hour weeks, you know, for so many years, you know, and that's why I'm kind of like, hey, okay, this is, this is it now, you know. Uh, but uh, but yeah, it's difficult. It's difficult to, to get, but uh, yeah, it's difficult to keep moving without help, you know. And, and but yeah, you know, I think that the next smart thing that I would like to do is. Translate into, into the genes, you know, because as you can see without doing all the parameters and things like that, you can do just a simple genetic test and look at uh, polymorphisms. You know, and a polymorphism can give you some of the adaptation that you already measure. You know, a polymorphism can tell you, you know, but still we might have to go back to to, to the laboratory. But a polymorphism can tell you, like, hey, you know what, you uh, you have a good ability to a clear lactate. You know, now how can you improve it? And that's what. Uh, the, you said something really interesting about looking at the DNA. Um, now, there are two types of uh, DNA behaviors. There's the uh, phenotypical uh, behaviors that are, that are inherited. And then there are compensatory behaviors or compensatory expressions. How are you looking at attempting to isolate the two? 
Yeah, that's a good question. And one of the first, I'm not an expert in genetics by, by no means. So that's that's a process that I'm learning, right? Uh, but we know very well through the whole of the genetics field, right? That the, the genes, you know, the environment affects them very, very highly, you know. So that that's for example, there were some companies that were they were selling all these two tests, right? And now you can you can send, you know, and it's only if you can poke your eye your finger and put it like a piece of paper, you send it to the to the uh, to the company and it will tell you if your son or your daughter has these genes for being a marathon rider or a football player or whatever. The problem with that methodology is that the genes were fixed supposedly. So number one, you oh there's nothing I can do. And number two, like hey, I don't want to know my genes. I don't want to know. You know, sometimes we don't want to know, right? But as opposed to the whole different new aspect of the genetics, right? And that, hey, you know what? You have these genes that they show that you're, you're not very fast. Well, you don't have the fast genes, but you can improve it. So we're going to tell you how, right? And that's where you can you can you know work differently and try to translate all these data into that. Now, how? I have no idea how it's going to happen, you know? But it'll happen. I hope. But it's difficult. But I don't know what's about genes to start with. Can you talk a little bit about performance enhancing drugs and how this intersects with the Yeah, so that's the, this is one of the, of the main fights too, you know, like if you have a, 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 a doping, you know, you don't need any of this. <laughs> <laughs> so then my job is done. <laughs> my life, you know? So yeah, this, this is one of the whole things, you know, unfortunately, you know, now it, it's good that more and more, you know, like a different uh, organisms, uh, federations, uh, the WADA, the World Doping Organization, are cornering more and more the doping problem. The, the tests are more and more sophisticated, uh, and they're starting to run faster and faster as well, and they do big batches of tests. Uh, and also, there's the culture in the sport as well. Uh, there's more, especially, for example, in Europe, there's a lot of uh, criminal laws now. You can go to jail if you test positive for a substance, you know? So this is, this is it's not just uh, the different mechanisms like uh, from the sports organizations as well, but it's the, it's the law, right? And uh, you know, so they're cornering more that. And that's one of the things that I can more and more use as a law. Sometimes it was difficult, but now it's just, I can see, you know, that they're more and more demanding. Yeah. Let me play devil's advocate, uh, because this is debatable. There are many um, people like Malcolm Gladwell who, or Gladwell, from the New Yorker who suggests that perhaps we ought to allow uh, athletes to take PED up to a certain point uh, where it doesn't affect health. And indeed, if you told the American people or anybody that they couldn't take a performance enhancing drug to, you know, like Viagra to improve their performance there, <clears throat> or if you told somebody they couldn't take uh, you know, a pill that would make them smarter, or, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. It, it would be unacceptable in our society. So I'm not saying I agree with this, I'm just saying there's another side to this where it may actually be ethical and humane to allow people to take drugs to enhance their physical. Now let's move it to sports. Um, again, I'm agnostic, I'm playing a devil's advocate, but I think the argument is that essentially what you're doing is you're allowing the genetic lottery winners to win. Because if everybody's training about the same, the people with the better genetics are always going to win. And in fact, taking performance enhancing drugs would even the competition out. Now, if you could regulate it so that people, you don't put the athletes in harm's way, right? You don't want people dying, you know, yeah. as happened in the, the Tour de France or injuring themselves. Maybe that's a better way to go about it. And you can't really have a double standard where half of the people in society are taking Viagra and you're not allowing, you know, athletes to take substances that would help them recover or perform better so that the Genetic lottery winners are aren't always winning the race. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just it's a big debate, but I, I really think that uh, you know uh, I don't think it should happen. You know, I think that uh, you know whatever happens in our own homes, you know, whether we whatever or not, what happens in our homes, for example. But uh, the world of sports is about training. It's about uh, being honest. You know, it's about showing like a role model. You know, to, to others. You know. And I think that uh, it should be controlled, uh, you know, in a way. The other thing too is that 
what's the threshold, what's up, what's good for you, what's bad. What are the side effects in the long term? Many of these things, you know, that I mean, people might be taking. We don't know what's going to happen in 20 years down the road, and we're not going to serve these studies, you know, that's the whole thing, you know. And like any of any things in our society, you know, yeah, it's just we have all these rules, you know, in sports, I think that we have to have more rules. I agree 100% with you what you say, though, that hey, I was born with these teams. I mean, one, one athlete was telling me about this debate, hey, I was handicapped from the day I was born, because I don't have the genes of that guy. So why that guy has the genes that don't? They have to work twice and smarter, you know, to get to a step below, you know? Yeah, that's the way it is. I mean, unfortunately, if you are, if you are born here in, in the richest neighborhood in Denver, yeah, you have a way more chance in life, you know, than if you are born in the worst neighborhood, you know, unfortunately. You know, but that's, that's where I think it's, 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 it's uh, also, it's in here, it's to humans to, to struggle, to challenge, to keep fighting, you know? Like, I know, I, I try to see it more in that romantic way, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it is a debate, and uh, I mean, I'm, I'm very positioned to really not at all things, you know, and have control, and just, I would lose my job to start with, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you say to measure, to manage, and you look at the healthcare, and corporations are self-insured, and we have health programs and things. How far off are we from being able to measure some of these things? At an individual level, where you can have company programs where you can start finding out what your optimal fat burner is, really trying to improve people's health, which of course is going to have a positive impact on health insurance. Yeah, that's a very good question as well. And, and uh, yeah, it's a, it's an evolving concept, and you know, we're I think we're getting closer and closer. But uh, we we have to like I'm working now, for example, with us all these methodologies to kind of package them, you know, and they can be uh, assessed, you know, like what's your fat burner. What's your mitochondria, you know, at an ambulatory situation? It's difficult, uh, but I think that we get there someday. You know, the, uh, the American Medical Association and the American College of Sports Medicine, they, they got together about five years ago and they, they launched a program called Exercise is Medicine, right? The whole thing is to, to prescribe exercise, but uh, it's an evolving concept. It's sort of change, uh, you know, healthcare, you know, because we're really working towards like prevention, you know, and that's where we can measure a lot of parameters. And we can help individuals to improve performance, I mean, have to, to improve health, metabolic health, or prevent diseases. Uh, for example, like one or two months ago, the British Journal of Medicine came out with this uh, uh, study showing that exercise alone uh, is as efficient or more than drugs for 35 different diseases. You know? It's a big field out there, and, and, and it's going to change. You know? like it's an evolving concept, we have to make it. But what probably I think that the society is going to be very polarized. I think that we're going to have, a, uh, like recently, today actually, I was reading that by 2020, uh, half of the population of the US is going to be pre diabetic or diabetic. By 2020, this new data, but it's like older data showing that or predicting that by 2050, uh, uh, two thirds of the US population is going to be already pre diabetic or diabetic, you know. Uh, but then we have uh, Colorado freaks, you know, there's people, you know, that are super healthy, they, they're, you know, 70 years old, they're running marathons, they don't use any drugs, I mean, any, any medication at all, right? They're incredibly healthy, you know. The cost for these people is zero or very little, right? The cost for those people who have diabetes and chronic disease already, and we know that most of the cases of diabetes they involve also cardiovascular disease and Alzheimer's as well. You know, some people are such point. That's why I feel that we want to move there as well, because uh, um, uh, probably uh, type two diabetes and Alzheimer's is a senior metabolic disorder. You know, as a matter of fact, some people are calling uh, Alzheimer's with type three diabetes. You know, and uh, so anyway, yeah, it's it's possible that hey, why why in the world if I take care of myself? Right, if I commit it to my health and I eat well and I do exercise, uh, and I I don't spend money in health, you know, for psychic action, but why these other people who do care less about what they eat, they don't exercise, and you know, they're spending three thousand dollars a month in medical bills. Who's paying for that? I'm paying for that. Right? So at some point that the insurance they're gonna to have to kind of help those people to take care of themselves and, and maybe penalize those who acquire the disease because that's the whole thing. Type 2 diabetes is not something, 90% of the cases, it's not something that, oh, you wake up one day, oh, I have developed type 2 diabetes. You have acquired it because you want to be in the majority, you know? So, yeah, you should you know, but sometimes, yeah, it's difficult to penalize that way, right? But that's the whole thing, you know? I, 
I don't want to enter into the debate of the, of the socialized medicine or not, but we already have socialized medicine embedded in our system, even children. You know, like in five years here, back in wood, I had zero dollars in medical bills. And I try to take care of myself, like many other people, right? But some people couldn't care less. You know, they're, they're using $2,000 a month and they pay $500 a premium. So who picks up that bill? I pick up that bill, right? That's socialized medicine already, in a way, right? So sometimes we live in this whole, like, oh, the only way where you really take care of your own health is private, and the private is how you pay as you use. That's what I think. And insurance companies are starting to, to see that, and the prevention is going to be a more and more important model, I think, to us. But anyways, <laughs> what I can do on the website. Since you put your slide this, put them on. I have a part. I have a part to break yet. And it says uh, there are two pavements sitting in the cave, and one of them is saying, well, something's not right. Our air is clean, our water is pure, we get plenty of exercise, everything we eat is organic and free range, and yet nobody lives over 30. <laughs> yeah, I've seen that as well with regards to the potty diet or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah, they were eating by lions or dinosaurs or what they got sick or so too. They had a lot of environmental hazards back in the day. Okay. For, for, yeah, no, but I actually point that. Thank you. So for a real question, um, who owns the data that we collect? Well, now it's me and uh, the university. Um, because a lot of this data is personal data that belongs to the athletes, do they sign a release? Yeah, 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 yeah. I know the data, I know when I'm putting that together, it's yeah, identifiable already. Yeah, you cannot. Well, some of that I don't even know who is who because I have already yeah, identified it. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, I, I have been talking to the IT department, the TTO uh, at the university, and uh, yeah, so it's, it's a process. <laughs> but yeah, it's just that it's, it's, I own it, but uh, the university owns it. So if there's any selling of the data, you know, the, yeah, the TTO has a fee for that. As a matter of fact, now we're sending part of the data to a company, you know, for developing the product, you know, and yeah, the CTO has to do like a data, data release, uh, trans, trans, data transfer release or whatever they can use for that now. Um, what's the uh, degree of combination of them in the what type of research? I'm sorry? What type of training of, of degree or combination yeah. of them in the uh, that's a good question. So it's a, it's a little bit of everything. You know? So uh, I mean, maybe, uh, there's a um, definitely the pathway is the uh, uh, exercise physiology pathway. I think exercise metabolism. Uh, there's also some uh, medical training. You know, to understand some of the analysis, different different possible diseases, the sports medicine. Uh, it's a little bit of uh, of everything. So I think that. None of those training is going to give you, I think, you might be all the information, but I think that being there in the field for so many years, measuring, measuring, that's where you get more and more and more information. Yeah. But uh, those are kind of sports medicine, exercise physiology, uh, general medicine, you know, it can, it can, it can lead you there. Are you planning to introduce some of these um, this study to the program here? Or I'm sorry, the program. Are you planning to introduce some of the study you doing to the program here? Yeah, well, I, I'm working at the, the Actions Medical Campus and I work in the Family Medicine and Sports Medicine. We already show this to residents in sports medicine mainly. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'm open to, to show this to more people, of course. You know, it's, it's my passion and I like to, to show this, right? But, uh, but I don't know if this degree is, uh, you know, uh, uh, we're working to do something with Boulder. We have an integrity physiology. Hopefully, we can do maybe a master's degree in applied exercise physiology or sport medicine or things like that. But uh, yeah, it's not up to me. It's just, there's a lot of red tape at the university. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious about the uh, wind tunnel testing you were doing. Um, I'm just wondering if you said that uh, for different positions, you might find the most aerodynamic position for a cyclist. But it might be including you know, additional strain on the cyclist to maintain that position. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was wondering, like, when you're in the wind tunnel, are you measuring the strain to maintain a position and the resistance from wind at the same time? Or are you just looking at the resistance from the wind and then study the strain later on? Well, yeah, first you start by what's the uh, 
the, uh, the, the, uh, the CDA, which is a coefficient of, of, of air penetration, right? That's the magic number that is called for. The highest, the, the highest CDA, yeah, the, the, the worst, more than I'm speaking, you know? And then you come up with different positions. And you change the subtle and the things and the open up, whatever, open up like this and that. And that's what later on, right after that run, you speak of one run, you know, like three minutes or four minutes, and you do this position. And if you have a CDA, and the CDA is wow, this is fantastic. And that's right after the run, you measure the metabolic response. Okay. Right? And that's where you can see, well, the metabolic response for this position you throw. And again, eventually you get to a point where you might see, wow, this, this is the second or third fastest position, right? Uh, which is not that far from the first one, but metabolic is speaking, wow, it's so much more complex. So you go get that. Okay. Do you have a question too? Oh, yeah. So, what's the easiest way uh, for someone to do an assessment on uh, the oxidation rate and uh, like uh, waxing, uh, wax gas and the Yeah. So, yeah, we have uh, at, the, uh, at the Anschutz Health and Wellness Center, we're offering this to the public. So, one thing that we do, we, we open the doors to the entire community, right? Uh, and that's, that's a very good initiative by the university. That's made this not to open this to the lead athletes or so. It's open the doors to anybody. That's what we have now. We have Tons of people are coming, you know, all the time from all levels, from recreational athletes, from professional athletes, you know, people who, hey, I want to do my first 5K, I've never done it, or, or see, hey, I want to do my fitness, I want to know what's my fat burning so I want to know what should I eat when I exercise. So, so we have a lot of people who are age, we have people in the 50s or 60s, you know. Uh, yeah, so you can go I choose health and wellness center and look through and sports performance program, that's the way it's called. Get information there. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody, and I appreciate it. And uh, sorry if I was too uh, academic or, you know, but uh, it was important. I appreciate uh, this presence here.